on the way to medical school, everybody has a something that was was something maybe they're not so proud of. And I'm a big believer in whether it's grades, whether it's an institutional action, you need to be able to talk about that, acknowledge it, and show how you've grown from it and not be afraid of it. You don't have to perseverate on it, but I think you have to be ready to acknowledge it, talk about it, and show that growth. And that's something that shows maturity, which is something that we're looking for in, in our applicants. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 595th episode of Admission Straight Talk. Thanks for tuning in. Are you ready to apply to your dream medical schools? Are you competitive at your target programs? Accepted's Med School Admissions Quiz can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash med quiz, complete the quiz, and you'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your chances of acceptance. Plus, it's all free. Again, take this quick quiz at accepted.com slash med quiz to obtain your free assessment and those invaluable tips. Today's guest, Dean Valerie Ratz, earned her MD at Johns Hopkins, where she also did her residency in obstetrics and gynecology and a fellowship in reproductive endocrinology. She joined the Washington University faculty in 1994 and currently is Associate Dean for Admissions and a Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Washington University School of Medicine. Dean Ratz, welcome back to Admissions Straight Talk. Thank you. Thanks for allowing me to join you today. My pleasure. Okay, let's start with the basics. Can you give an overview of the Washington University School of Medicine program, focusing on its more distinctive elements? Yes, I think the, the really interesting thing about uh, the curriculum here at Washington University School of Medicine is we call it the gateway curriculum. It's about only three years old, and we put in some very novel portions to it in, in terms of what a, a normal medical school curriculum has. I think the key thing is it's divided into three phases, phase one, two, three. The first phase is called Gateway to Foundations, 16 months long, and that's that traditional part of a medical school curriculum where you learn some of the foundational knowledge, the basic sciences, the clinical sciences that you're going to apply as you take care of patients. But uniquely during our first phase, we have you enter into the clinical environment very early on so you can get an idea of what it's like in the clinical environment as you're learning those basic sciences. One, to sort of keep you very interested but also to have, so that you have a perspective. The three clinical areas that you rotate through are inpatient, outpatient, and periprocedural. We want you to understand what it's like to be a medical student and to be a doctor, but also we think that uniquely in that period of time as a very early medical student, you also have a very unique perspective of how the patient views medicine, uh, relationships with other healthcare providers in that area. And we want to use that unique lens to help you be a better doctor when you're a little bit older down the line. So that's one of the things I think that's unique about the beginning of our medical school. Then we have you rotate for 12 months through the all the different clinical subspecialties, which is standard part of every medical school, medicine, surgery, pediatrics, OBGYN, psychiatry, and neurology. And then finally, the third phase is called gateway to specialization. And this is about the last almost year and a half of medical school, where now you've rotated through the different areas of medicine, you have an idea of what you think you like, and you can spend the final portion of your medical school career, almost, almost a year and a half, sort of specializing and getting extra knowledge that'll prepare you for your residency. So I think that's what really makes our curriculum quite unique. And then the final thing is that we have what's called explore. And explore is this concept that there are these different areas in medicine besides your specialty. And the areas of medicine that we think we do really well in teaching you about are research, innovation, advocacy, and education. And so you have your specialty, but you also have the areas of medicine that you're really excited about. And so we give you the ability to learn special skills in those 
areas of medicine that you can take into your future career. So is the explore part of the curriculum part of the third phase or is it it's, it's part of the third phase? It's it's emphasized in the third phase, but we start at the very beginning. There is actually a, a, a four week period in the in phase one of the curriculum where you pick one of those four areas and you spend four weeks learning about that specific area, the skills that you need in that specific area. And we also have you do a scholarly project. And then as you go through phase two, there are times where you could even come out of phase two and spend uh, additional time in that scholarly area. And then in phase three, again, that's where you spend most of the time looking at Explore. And that's where we have our our uh, other degrees, our dual degrees, where you can actually get an MPH if you are interested in advocacy. You might do a year of research in uh, bioinformatics or bioengineering if you're interested in science and innovation. And you might even do an MBA, which we have an MBA dual degree program if you're interested in innovation also. So there's all sorts of different dual degrees that you can add in phase three that enhance that explore part of um, our, our curriculum. And, and explore is, again, something that you would, you would focus on, right? So a, a specific student might decide to focus on advocacy or a specific student might decide to focus on innovation, but they're not really exploring all four areas. Well, that's a really good question you asked, Linda. In the beginning, in phase one, we do introduce you to all four of these areas. Okay. Because every doctor needs skills in all four of these areas as they go on and practice medicine. So there are times in phase one of the curriculum where we talk about all four of those areas, help you understand what makes you tick, what really excites you. And then you can go through phase two and phase three of the curriculum where you can emphasize one or two of those areas. We don't track people. Got we, it. we don't believe in tracking. We we really believe that you should really, in medical school, get to explore all these different areas. And then you begin to sort of narrow down in that phase three and really enhance your knowledge maybe in one or two of their, those areas with a scholarly project specifically in one. Got it. Now, the next question I think is related a little bit to what we've been discussing, but I want to focus on a little bit more. When I was preparing for the call, I noticed that flexibility is something that's touched on a lot. Uh, it's built into the gateway curriculum. Can you touch on that or dive a little bit deeper into it? I mean, you, you just mentioned it a little bit in the discussion of Explore, but maybe you, there's more to, to learn about it. Right. I think medical school is truly a time when we need to give our students the opportunity to see the, all the different areas that you can consider as you go into the field of medicine. And so flexibility is key in giving you the, the time you need to explore those areas and the opportunity to figure out what you need to do to explore those areas. So phase one is a little more, I don't wanna say rigid, but a little more planned, like here's the, all the things that you're gonna do for 16 months. There's all this base, there's seven foundational modules that we go through. Um, there is that four week period of time where you can pick an area of medicine and explore and kind of concentrate on that. So that, but that's pretty, that's pretty straightforward. Then you enter phase two, which is where you rotate through all those, um, the six areas of medicine. You can take up to eight weeks out of phase two, which is that 12 month period of time and step out and go and do a project that could last up to eight weeks if you wanted to. A and non-clinical then, project? Non-clinical project really? if you wanted to, yes. And we believe that's very important. Then after phase two, it's wide open. You can do a dual degree at that point. Mm -hmm. You have all these different rotations that you can do. We really want to give you the flexibility to figure out what area of specialty and what also area of medicine, as I mentioned, that you really want to practice in in the future in terms of education, advocacy, science, innovation. You know, we think that we make academic physicians, people who are going to go into academics in the future, and, and you need the ability, how do we educate? How do we teach? How do we do research? How do we think about innovation in medicine to move the field of medicine forward? So, and then advocacy, very important, a very important aspect of our medical school. We, we are committed to, to growing and teaching and educating physicians who will give back to their communities in the future. 
Wonderful. Speaking of giving, I noticed that uh, the website said that 85% of the med students receive merit and or need-based scholarships. Mm -hmm. I assume that most of those are are partial scholarships, but that's a pretty high percentage. Again, right. you'd like to elaborate on that. Yeah, I'm no, sure, I'm sure no, listeners will be really interested in this. Yes, point. <laughs> no, very much so. You know, the, the cost of a medical education is something we would never want to prohibit someone from, um, you know, studying medicine because of, we would never want that to happen. And so we're committed to making sure that medical education is affordable to our medical students. So this year and the in the past year, 89 percent oh, wow. of okay. our students received some type of aid, either merit or need-based aid. And 67% of our students had full tuition. Wow. Now, uh, about a, a significant, about a third of that full tuition were our MSTP students, our MD, PhD students who received full tuition. But, you know, overall, 67% of the class received a full tuition award to come to WashU. So we think that's important. Uh, we have, if you look at overall debt, when our students graduate from medical school, it's in, in a, 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 compared to the national averages, we're in like the fifth percentile. So wow. significantly lower um, educational debt at the end of medical school here at Washington University. That says a lot because I've talked to some medical school graduates. I mean, they're and I think most, if they don't get scholarships, they're in the $300,000 more right. range of debt. Yes, we're under 100,000. The average medical school debt at our institution at the end of medical school educational debt is under $100,000, which we think is important. We would never want the finances to determine what specialty you choose and yeah. what area of medicine, you're, how you're going to practice, whether you want to practice in a community, um, assisting in a community and an under-resourced area, we think that is important as we educate our students. It's kind of putting your money where your mouth is, that's for sure. <laughs> Let's turn to the WashU application. What is the secondary like, and does WashU screen before sending out secondaries? So the secondary is a supplemental application. Yeah. There's a, a little bit of demographic information, and there really are um, two major short answer questions that we have on there. And basically, it, the two questions are, tell us about a time when you failed or been unsuccessful, which I think is important. Most people that come to medical school have failed in something. And I think that, you know, when you see someone who, who overcomes their failure, who learns from their failure, there learns from their failure, that that shows grit, determination, and resiliency. And that's something that we really, we really look for. And then the other big short answer question is we, we ask if there's anything else that they would like to tell us that they haven't had a chance to write about. You know, are there obstacles, challenges, experiences that they wish to tell us about, um, you know, that they've had on their way, on their journey to medical school. So we think that that's very important too. Uh, we send everybody a secondary and that's part of our process. And then we look at an entire application. We look at everybody's completed application to Wash U Medical School. So that's how we screen. Great. I love the failure question. I was actually just, just reading something about, you know, personal growth. And if you can't acknowledge that you've had a failure or done it, then you can't grow. Very yes. simple. You can't learn, you can't grow. And I also read something else that a mistake is a mistake mm -hmm. if you learn from it and it's a failure if you don't. That's a great quote. I love that quote. You know, I think you bring up this concept that I, as an admissions dean, I, I talk about this a lot, this concept on the way to medical school, everybody has a something that was, was something maybe they're not so proud of. And I'm a big believer in whether it's grades, whether it's an institutional action, you need to be able to talk about that, acknowledge it, and show how you've grown from it and not be afraid of it. You don't have to perseverate on it, but I think you have to be ready to acknowledge it, talk about it, and show that growth. And that's something that shows maturity, which is something that we're looking for in, in, our, in our applicants. Absolutely. And, and the ability to overcome and bounce back, as you said, grit and resilience. Absolutely. 
Um, you, you will need that when you're in medical school. Invariably in medical school, there will be times when things aren't going so well. So do you have that skill set that you've utilized before to overcome what you need to in medical school? That's right. Great question. And I guess we've discussed a little bit what you what you hope to glean from at least that question, but what do you hope to glean from the other question that perhaps doesn't get covered in the, in the primary? So I think that, you know, uh, it's important. We want to know about experiences, obstacles, um, challenges in one's life, which may be related to how they grew up, the culture in which they've lived, the experiences that have been difficult for them. And that's a, an important part of the application for you to talk about those types of things so that we can even ask you about them. Um, your okay, challenge. It would show, it would show re grit and resilience. Right, right, right. And there's all sorts of different um, sorts of experiences and challenges that that maybe we don't know how to to, to ask you about, or we're not so we know we're not allowed to just say what you know. Tell me, just have you ask about these things? We want you to talk about them so that we can ask you about them and learn more about them. What if the applicant feels like their most impactful experience essay from the primary is where they discussed the biggest challenge they had, or or uh, cultural challenges or background challenges? Should they? explore that incident or that factor from a different angle in, your, in the secondary? Should they choose a different, exp I mean, I realize that this is hard to, to give an answer for every single individual because every right. in, individual's background experiences are so different. But that was one question that came to, to mind as, as you were talking that they very well may have talked about that in the impactful experience essay. Right. I think that this area, the, the question that we have is on a, a place that we allow you to expand. That okay. other impactful experience is pretty, it's a pretty small little area. And this allows us to expand it. Um, and if there's other areas that they haven't been able to mention them in, the, in that area of the secondary. And what is the word limit for this or the character limit? Do you remember? 500. It's, okay. it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty generous. Okay. Yeah, pretty okay. generous. Wonderful. Now, the interview experience at WashU was also a little different and frankly, rather demanding. Interviewed applicants do both the asynchronous virtual interview, yes. a, also known as a standardized video interview. And that is completed before the two live Zoom interviews, which I assume are with human beings like you and I are talking now. Can you That's explain crazy. the difference and why you want all three? Yeah. I guess so I just the, explained the difference, but go ahead. Yeah, you did. You did a great <laughs> job explaining. Yeah. So the standardized video interview is basically a video interview that we, we do. We have standardized questions that we ask our applicants. There's basically three verbal questions that we have you give a verbal answer and one question that we have you give a written answer. And it's timed. So what happens, you get all set up, you sit in front of the computer and we say, we push the button to go. And we basically give you questions that are asked on video by our, our medical students. Um, they're behavioral and situational judgment questions. You have 90 seconds to prepare your answer. And then computer comes on and you have 120 seconds to give your answer. And we think that ability to think quickly and organize your thoughts and give a coherent answer in a defined period of time is an important skill for physicians and something that we use. Um, and then we also have a, a, a written question um, that, so that we can see writing in sort of a timed fashion too. And so that's, that's the standardized video interview. We glean good information from that, uh, but I think the really important information that we get on our applicants comes from this live interaction that we have when we do our, 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 our Zoom interviews. Yes. And is each interview with one individual? Are they professors, students, admissions professionals? Right, right, so. right. So uh, the interviews that you have one-on-one -on -one, um, are with our, our faculty and staff and senior staff. Uh, there is a standard interview where the interviewer has the your entire application and is able to review it in advance and has about 30 to 45 minutes to talk to you. It's a conversation. It's about understanding your motivations for medicine, 
the experiences that you've had, um, why Wash U would be a good medical school for you. Tell me about your research. You know, why do I ask about research? Because I think that when someone talks about your research, and it doesn't have to be in medicine, it just has to be a question. And you, you know, research is you ask a question, you gather some type of data, and then you get that data, you analyze it, and you think about what are all my other questions. So it as what do doctors do? They have to take complex scientific information, they have to distill it down, and they have to communicate that to patients and patients' families so that the patient and the patient's family can understand and make the choice that's right for them. So many times that's why we ask about research because it allows us to understand, can you talk to people about research, the science and, and have a conversation? So I think that's um, really important. So that's the standard interview. The closed file interview, again, one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member or senior staff, is an interview that's 20 to 30 minutes. And in that interview, all the interviewer knows is your name and, and pronoun. That's um, it. And that's it. Honest Not even a resume. Wow. Nothing, wow. nothing else. And it's so it's a conversation. It's a blank slate. And there you go. And you can talk again about your motivations for medicine, the things that you've done on your way to medical school, your background, your challenges, experiences, why you want to be a doctor. Um, and uh, and so it's, it's, it's short, uh, but it uh, but, you know, it's a it's a blank slate. It's a conversation. We try really hard. We're a collaborative school. Faculty and students work with each other. We're making medicine better. And it, it isn't about us being mean during the interview. We want to be kind um, and understanding and have a conversation about making sure that you fit. Right. What what are we doing in medical school as, a, as admissions officers? We're looking to see, do you fit? fit into our medical school and you should be looking at us to say, do we fit you too, right? Is this the right medical school for you? It's a two-way street, which I think is so very important. Um, so that's a, that's part of our personality here at WashU. I right. hope it that comes through because it's important. Oh, absolutely. It's a little bit like dating. Uh, <laughs> you know, one thought that, it, that occurred to me is in terms of the, the blind or the closed interview, it's almost like meeting a patient for the first time. Yes, I think that's true. Think you know, that's walking through uh, an ER room for the first time, you don't know the person. No. So a skill set, right? Yes. How exactly. do you introduce yourself? How do you communicate? Yeah. Do Personal you allow presence. the other your presence? Do you allow you you know not talk over someone? And that's hard to do sometimes in Zoom, right? We've had to develop these skills. I think. Right, right. I think yeah. it, it can also be hard to do in person. Oh, sure, sure. You know, especially if somebody's a little on the shyer side. Right. But uh, it is a skill set. Right. So, right. And um, the faculty want to pull, want the students to talk and, and to hear their thoughts, right? Yes. Right. So obviously, you know, you, you got to get to the interview stage. Now the stats from matriculating students at WashU are through the roof <laughs> for the 2023 entering class. I think the mean MCAT was a five, wait a minute, I have written down here, 519.5, mm -hmm. the uh, 3.88 mean GPA and WashU received 5,702 applications, interviewed 1,057 and just admitted a very happy class of M1s. I think I don't, I didn't write down 124, that number. 124. 124. Okay. 124. I didn't have that number written down, Yeah. but um, you know, that's, those are pretty impressive numbers and pretty long odds besides stats. What makes an applicant jump off the page for you? So first thing I want to say, when we say stats like that, you gave an average, but the range is wide. Great. We go all the way down to 505 um, up, all the way up to the top, but, and we've got, we have people who have GPAs that are, you know, in the, just above 3.0, okay, all the way up to 4.0. So the, okay. there is a wide range, and I think that's very, very important. I'm so, really glad you brought that up. No, it's very important. Yes. You know, we follow the double AMC holistic review model. This is a mission-driven uh, approach where we think about 
experiences, attributes, and metrics. So metrics are a piece of the puzzle, but experiences and attributes are just as important, if not more important, right? So oh, some trend too. Yeah, and trend. Oh, absolutely. Trend, you're absolutely correct. You know, someone may have a lower GPA, but at the end of it all, it started out poorly and then they went up. Wow, that's that grit, resilience, determination absolutely. coming right through. That's what we're looking for. People who learn from the mistakes and able to, to overcome. I that That's so important. So metrics is a piece of the puzzle, but I think mostly what we're looking at your, are your experiences and your attributes in the application. Right. Now, I really appreciate the fact that you mentioned the range. And that's really the limitation of focusing on average because average is not a ceiling, it's not a roof, right? There's right. it's in the middle, it reflects. And so it's it's a snapshot, but it's a kind of fuzzy snapshot, not a very sharp one. Right. At the same time, I'm sure you as an admissions officer want the confidence the people you admit are going to do well. So if somebody does have, let's say, a low GPA, or they do have a lower than average MCAT, I'm going to guess that they have to show you in some way that they can handle the work. They have to either a post back program, uh, high GPA, low MCAT, high MCAT, low GPA, plus context for the low GPA. Would, was Am I correct? You are absolutely, you are, you're taking the words right out of my mouth. So Please go ahead. Saying, Please go ahead. No, that's exactly how we look at it. We're looking at, again, we want to make sure people are successful in medical school. Um, and that's very, very important, the, the, the work. And, and, you know, there's always this concept that people, um, they, they can grow along the way. So, you know, there are people that, you know, maybe this medical school at the very beginning might not be the perfect place for them, but, but ultimately residency, fellowship, and being attending here. So we're, we're always thinking about that too. We want people to be successful here. Um, and we bring in people who have lower MCATs and lower GPAs. And one of the things I hope we do get a chance to talk about is our student success program. We have coaching and all sorts of ways to support students who may have initially some difficulty along the way. So there's a, an incredible program here in coaching and um, mentoring our students. So you know, we, we like to put the metrics to the side. And when we review okay. applications, we don't actually, the metrics aren't up in front and looking at the faculty. In fact, we blind them. Really? We take, yes. We take the metrics off the application and look at the application in terms of the experiences, the letters of recommendation, the answers to the, the short essay answers and, and your personal essay. That's what we're, we're looking at when we decide, is this the right person for our medical school. And what happens if you say this person has the grit, has the resilience, has the experiences, I think they're going to make a position, but then you look at the numbers. We, we want to interview them. We want to see them. We want to see them in person. Okay. So the initial review of a file is mm -hmm. we, we look without the metrics. Really? That's really We interesting. look without the metrics and we decide, we score the application. Uh -huh. And then we decide who we wish to interview and then again, when you come in to interview, again, the metrics are not in front of the, the interviewers. interviewer. Yeah. Close file absolutely know nothing about the metrics. Sure. Nothing. Sure. Write everything up. And so the interviewers interview, understand the applicant, their conversation, and write things up. Now, at the end of the day, when we have our subcommittee meeting, where the interview scores are there, the application rating scores are there. We look at everything um, in, 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 in whole, in total, right. and decide right. who we think best would do, would you know, meet the mission of our medical school and do well here yes. and, and be a great physician for the future. So coming from WashU. I've, I've interviewed a few admissions directors who say that they don't look at the metrics first but they usually do come into play much At sooner. The well, no. they usually come into play, I think before interview would be more common, even mm -hmm. for those schools that don't look at them initially, but they're still fairly few from, to my knowledge. And um, I think you're giving holistic admissions much more meaning when, when you blind that at least until the end. Obviously you can weigh it at the end, but you're giving all those other qualities a right. much bigger chance to shine forth. Shine. 
right. when, when, when you don't have the numbers staring you in the face. That's true. Yeah. That's what we believe. Right. Okay. Let's look at some of the aspects of the application that sometimes cause applicants to, should I do it? Should I not do it? How do you view letters of intent? Or let's, let's call them update letters as opposed yeah. to letters of intent, okay? At any time during the process or correspondence from waitlisted applicants. So update letters. Yeah. Um, let's talk about those first. Okay. Um, we, we take up update letters. Okay. You know, if, you know this, this application review process, if you think about it, applicants are filling that out in, in April, May, June. Right. And, that, and things go on after that period of time. So I, we, if someone writes us an update letter, we take that and we place it in the file. So that when it, you know it's in the file and we can look at that, the applic the reviewers, whether the raters or the interviewers, can look at that information. So that is utilized in the process. So we we do accept update letters. Now I wouldn't be writing an update letter every two weeks. That's not no I'm, no. You have to be I, I know I know I know. Being practical here, right? Right, you know, right. You want to update when there's something truly significant to update about. Right, right. That's obvious, but but important to, to recognize. So, Absolutely. You know, you know, maybe one or two update letters over a period of, you know, this maybe six to nine month period of time would be appropriate with appropriate, truly informative, important information. So that's your update letter. The, you know, the next kind of letter that sometimes we get is this, you know, after the end of the interview season, when you're you're doing that letter of intent. So Wash, you were always looking for individuals, as I said before, who, who feel that this is the place where they fit, where they will, because when you fit, you'll flourish. And we want our students to flourish here, that they, they see the opportunities that will be good for them to grow and do the things that they wanna do. So I say at the end of the season, when you're all done with your interviews, genuinely think about where you would like to go to medical school. And if Wash you truly, genuinely, authentically, and, and that's important, authentic, being, being authentic is important in this process. Yeah. So professionalism, right? If authentically, this is the place that really would fit you in your mind, we'll, we like those letters of intent that tell us why, after you've gone through this process, why this would be the right place for you. And again, we take those letters and we place them in our application database. So I think that we, um, it can be in, important, especially as we get to the wait list too. Right. We take a fair number of students from the wait list. And obviously when we make an acceptance from the wait list, we want that individual to say, yes, um, and so those types of letters can be helpful at that point in the process also. Right. I, I like how you said, it's not just that in a letter of intent, you say, my intent is to go to the schools, that you also give the reasons. Yeah. The why's that's, are important in this world. Very important. Very important. <laughs> because again, I've talked to many admissions officers that say they disregard letters of intent. Because uh, so many times somebody said, oh, you're my number one choice. They offer them acceptance and then they go elsewhere. Yeah. So they're, they're very suspicious of the credibility. On the other hand, if you give really solid reasons, then it's much more meaningful and persuasive. Absolutely. So, right. Yeah. Now, let's go back to two things you said earlier. One was about the student success program which yes. I would like to follow up on. Right. And then the, the second question, I'll we'll, why don't let you answer that one first and uh, then I'll ask my next question. Right. So I think we're a medical school and we, as you've heard me mention, medical school can be tough at times and we recognize that. And, uh, you know, if we bring someone into our medical school, the goal, we know they're great and they're wonderful and they're amazing and we're going to help them get through medical school. So every student, from day one is given a faculty coach who is a special faculty member. There's only a few of them. The, the faculties have to apply to be a coach and they're given specialty training to help in coaching students. And there's small groups of students with a coach and that coach stays with them through the entire time of their medical school. 
from day one till they graduate. That coach will never assess them. Okay, so they're never grading them in any, and we don't, we can talk about grades a little bit. We don't have grades. We have, we can, we have a unique way of how we assess our students in their preparation. Um, so coaches never assess, they're never part of, you know, when they go to apply to residency, those types of things, they're not writing letter, they're not doing that type of letter. They're there really and truly to help mentor them through the process. They know if they're having difficulty with whatever, okay, here's where you need to go and, and, and get help with this. We have in our educational program, we have the students have dashboards. So we have a dashboard of how they're doing in all the different areas. And we assess basically six areas in our students, patient care, medical knowledge, interpersonal communication skills, professionalism, practice-based learning and improvement, and system-based practice. These are the six areas that as a medical student you're assessed on. It's the same types of areas that you're assessed on as you go through residency. So we start doing this at the very, very beginning. And so we have this dashboard and, and all these different areas when you're at the beginning in the, in the first part of the curriculum, phase one, there's different areas of your knowledge, how you're doing clinically. So there's this dashboard keeping track of all these different areas and the coach can see those areas and is there to help and say, you know, you're not doing as well in this one particular area and anticipate, I think it would be, you would behoove you to go and work on this. Or I think you're going to want to, you know, in phase three, you're thinking about you want to go into this area of medicine. I think you might want to do this, this rotation, um, those types of things. Or, you know, you've had some difficulty in the past with standardized tests or maybe some of the tests that you're taking, the shelf exams that you're taking. You know what? Let's anticipate that we maybe need to spend a little bit extra time getting ready for taking step one or more importantly, step two. So helping you with the knowledge base that they have to kind of anticipate any issues that you're going to have and coach you through so you will be successful in medical school and on into residency sure. in the area of medicine you want to go into. I'm really glad you, you raised that because I, I wasn't planning to ask the question, but I'm, I'm glad you raised it. And, and uh, I think that's really important to know. Now, like, let's say somebody's not doing so well, I don't know, in the area of professionalism, would the right. coach come and say, you know, you're not, your, your scoreboard shows that you're not doing so well in the area of professionalism. How specific does the coaching get? Because if you just say, I think you need to focus on this or anything to work on it. Well, maybe they do need to work on it, but they also need advice. Well, you know, if, if tardiness is an issue, for example, right. Okay. Just, which is an area of, of professionalism, I assume. Yes. Telling somebody, you know, be on time when they're chronically late. I mean, the, I have a relative. I mean, the joke is that she was born 10, ten minutes late and never, never caught up. <laughs> but, <laughs> never caught up. But I mean, you know, it's like, I would think you have to go a little beyond that. Are the coaches trained to be more specific in, in their coaching? Oh, yes. They're, they're trained to be very specific in, okay. in recognizing this is an issue. Uh -huh. And, and, and also getting advice, even from the other coaches, the coaches actually get together, not with any specifics of what specific, you know, names, right. but here's an issue that we're having. How, how can we address this? You know, th this might be something that is, there are multiple students in a particular area or, or class or whatever. And so they can approach it sort of in a system wide fashion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? You can, right. you can all, you have time, you, the, you meet with your coach, you mean every week during the, the phase one of the curriculum. And that's you, individually, right? Individually, every week, and also in groups too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in groups, your, your, your small coaching group of maybe five to eight students. Phase two, you meet one-on-one -on -one with your coach and you also meet as a group every every clerkship and then in phase three you meet on a regular basis also as you're preparing for residency um your application so we're already looking at what do we need to do to be to be ready to go so there's lots of one-on-one -on -one time the coaches are basically that is part as a fa as part of being a, a, a faculty coach they are given specific allotted amount of time designated to this is my job 
Right. This is how I'm going to help my students. And the coaches also meet together and can talk to each other of, of learning how to best, what is the best practice for advising? You know, if someone continues to be tardy, what is a good way to fix to that? Or is this a common thing that's happening as a big group? We need to address this as a class. Right. 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 For sure. All or right. is it something, syst- is there a systems issue? If someone's always late to a lecture, is it because there's something going on clinically that they're not letting them free in time to be on time for that lecture? Or maybe right? the Those classes are, the- are physically, geographically too far right. apart to get right. from point A to point B. Right. So that's a systems error. And you have to, you know, to fix a systems error, you have to recognize the systems error. Absolutely. Again, you have to recognize uh, mistakes and problems, right? In order to fix them. All right, let's go back to the prerequisites and things like that. More the application process or what students need to have or do to be prepared. How do you view prerequisites taken at a community college? Prerequisites we, from medical know, school. Yeah, so we look at prerequisites as competencies, okay? okay. So our prerequisites, um, one year of biology, one year of chemistry, one year of organic or a semester of organic and a semester of biochemistry, one year of physics and one year of math, uh, calculus. So either one semester of calculus or and a semester of statistics. So that can be substituted. So, and these are competencies, okay? So we feel like you need these competencies to be ready and prepared for medical school. So the idea of our prerequisites is we think they're, it's necessary to have passed that and have that in the general information and knowledge that you would have from having those classes. And so we we look at community college classes as if you pass, then you pass that competency. That's that's how we believe it. Now, um, you know, if you if you've had AP credit, okay, great. One of the things I'd like to see if you've passed all those things is okay, and your schedule is wide open, I'd like to see you take some upper level classes and do well, right? right. To dive more deeply into an area. Um, Get that, that demands knowledge. the knowledge you acquired in community college. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, especially if you're looking at as, at comp- as competencies. Right. What about shadowing? I know some schools absolutely want to have their, their applicants have shadowing experience. Some say it's desirable, but not required. Some say it's uh, a sign of privilege and they don't, don't want it to be required. because not everybody has the relationships mm-hmm. with, with doctors to, to shadow. Or does its value depend on what other clinical exposure an applicant has? I mean, if you've been EMT for three years, do you really have to shadow? So shadowing. So here's how I think we at WashU look at shadowing is, I think that you need to be able to answer the question, why do I want to be a doctor? So you have to kind of know a little bit of what, what a doctor does and what's happening within the healthcare space. I believe that you can understand what's happening in the healthcare space by watching in a variety of different ways. It doesn't have to be a one-on-one shadowing experience. It's nice to maybe get to do that once or twice, but I don't think you need to have extended periods of time, you know, one or once or twice getting to kind of observe, but that could be observing, you know, it could be observing as an EMT, it could be observing being a volunteer in a, in an emergency room, kind of, you know, as a, you know, attack stocking shelves and things like that, you get, if you're, if your eyes wide open, you can see what's going on. Scribing, a wonderful way to do that. I'm also a big believer, you know, something even like hospice, you're, you're in that healthcare space, you're, you're, you're working with patients, sitting by patients' bedsides and helping in that way, observing the nurses, the, the technicians, the, the medical assistants, all of those types of experiences are important. The, but I think the key thing is when you're asked the question, why medicine, that you have a, a, co- a coherent answer of, of there is some clinical aspect to that. You know, the other thing about that is that if anybody shadows or watches, it isn't always fun. Doctors do things that are sometimes, or healthcare providers, I should say, do things that aren't, are difficult at times sure. and understanding that there are difficult conversations at times and just observing the, the difficult things that happen. I think that's important to understand that about medicine. It isn't always like we cure everybody. 
It's not like a television show. No, it's not. And it's hard at times. Absolutely. And, you know, sometimes you even observe, I always say, you know, have you, one of the questions I sometimes ask is, you know, what have you seen in, as you've observed in the clinical space that was good? And then I always go, I kind of flip and I say, and what have you seen that's not so good? And being authentic and genuine, and I think that's important. It is. It is. I have uh, sometimes get together with some friends, old friends regularly. And uh, the leader of this group likes to say, what is a rose and a thorn in your life? Yeah. Oh, I like that. I may, I may steal that. From <laughs> you're, you. you're welcome to borrow it. It's not, <laughs> I thought it was good too. Cause you know, that old friends get together to every few months and uh, what's going on in your life. Well, there's yeah. good. And there's almost always something that's uh, poking you a little bit, you know? Right. Right. And, and the maturity to understand that in medicine, I think is so Im- important. But that is empathic. Yeah. Yeah. What is the common mistake that you see applicants make in approaching the primary, the secondary, or the interviews at WashU? Um, I think one of the things that I, I don't like that I see sometimes on applications is uh, when people have to describe an institutional action. I okay. think that I see them kind of act like the institutional action didn't happen. And I'm like, hmm, be, be honest about what happened. Uh, you know, describe it completely, not, again, not overdoing it, but being honest about it and describing how, how you did learn from that and how you're never going to do that again, right? Being honest. And so I think that that's a, that's a mistake that I see people make that I don't, I really don't like that. Um, Wait, they, they, they don't take responsibility. They, they don't, don't take responsibility. And they don't show how they learned. That's the mistake, right? They don't right? show how they learn. They kind of try to brush it off. Right, don't, right. No, you know, if you've, you know, obviously you, you may think it was small and minor and not important, but the institution thought it was big enough and important enough that they, you know, said, no, that wasn't right to do that. So I think right. you have to own, you have to own things, right? Right. We all do things. We all make mistakes, especially young people who are typically the age group that are applying to medical school. We, that's it's okay. We get that as admissions officers. The key thing is that you learn from that mistake and you're not going to do that again. That's right. really important. I was talking to a medical school reapplicant re- recently, a prospective client, and he had a, sh- a sharp drop in grades, I think, in his junior year. And uh, I was like, what, what happened? It says life happened. Yeah. but I didn't, I didn't, I don't want to talk about it on my application. So I let it go and came back to it a little later in the conversation. And I said, you don't have to tell me what, what happened on this call. You really don't have to. Okay. I said, but I really want you to think about whether you want to tell the admissions officers because you know, life happens to them also. Sure. And if you don't tell them what happened, then they won't know what happened. They won't know if you were in jail. They won't know if, you know, somebody died if you had a serious mental health problem, uh, Mm -hmm. if there was an addiction issue, Mm -hmm. they're going to have to use their imagination if you don't tell them. But again, realize they are human beings and life happens to them also. Right. Right. I I think that's important. You know, I, I, I think that in addition to what we talked about, about the ability to learn from failure, learn from a mistake, so it doesn't just become a failure, a a perpetuating failure, Mm -hmm. I might add, a self-perpetuating you know, if you, if you take responsibility, you take ownership, you, you're basically transforming that rather sad event into a learning experience. A mistake can be a learning experience or it can be a failure. It's a failure when you don't learn from it to go back from that quote I read, (laughs) you know, that we started out with it. So, Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, again, I think you're raising an excellent point in terms of what is a very common mistake take responsibility you don't have to be happy about what you did you shouldn't regret it if it was a mistake but I agree. Uh, learn from it this show is scheduled to air october 1 that's a month before wash U's final date for submitting the mcas application for this application cycle if somebody is debating whether to submit in october or wait till next year what would you advise them it's quote unquote late in the cycle yeah, that that is a really difficult question. You're asking you're asking hard questions here. That's a hard <laughs> question. Okay, um, 
I can't think of any better person yeah, to no, ask that, them of. No, that's a hard, that's a hard question because that is that is really really late in the application yeah. cycle, and you have to re- understand that we're reviewing all these applications, and you know ultimately at the end of the day, those last few spots get really hard to get. Um, if you apply and you know you feel you're ap- you know you're late, but you feel this is this is an, a really wonderful a- the application. There's been there's been really great activities, and I'm I'm I don't see myself doing a whole lot more this next year. I would go for it. That you know the downside is cost. It's money, right? It's also it's time. Money. It's and time, right? You know to do what you have to do, but also there's a cost to applying to medical school, right? Um, if you don't get into medical school, how we look at this is, okay, you, you go again, and then next year you should be first in line. You should be, you know, applications June open one. June 1st. That should go in June 1. That's where you want to be. You want to be at the front of the line. And then that's, you know, really, really important just because we run out of space. Um, you know, it, sometimes people retake their MCATs, and now their MCAT is really, really great and really high. Well, that might you know, that, that makes, it makes you a stronger application. Um, You know, what, what activity did you, did you, what have you done? I never would wait, you know, my paper is going to get published. I wouldn't wait for that to, to apply in any way, shape or form. So I'm, you know, I'm really not answering your question very well. I'm acknowledging that it's, that's the truth. It's a, it's tough because I think you are being that late. You are a little behind yeah. Um, but if you have a really solid application and you have the time to apply and it is expensive, you have to consider that. Yeah. But if you don't get in, you're you're just going to say, I'm going to work really hard this whole year. You know, you have to if you have a late application, you you need to assume that you may not get in. And so you're working really hard this year. You can't stop. You know, you're doing your research, you're doing your scribing, you're doing your volunteering, you're you know, engaging in your community, you're, you're, you're taking some extra classes, you're doing all those things, you and you because you're going to enhance your application for the next one. Because if you apply, and then you apply again, we expect to see improvement of course. in that period of time. No, and yeah. I mean, Gross. but sometimes people don't, don't realize that they have the same application, you're like, well, nothing's changed. And even though it was late last year, we don't necessarily always consider that we just say, is there a difference in the application? Right. Got to grow. Got to keep growing. Don't Absolutely. stop. Absolutely. Absolutely. When you have a reapplicant, do you compare the applications? Oh, many times. Yes. We look at what they've done before and how is this application different, right? Right. And, and you know, that's one of those failure things. If you, you applied to medical school and you didn't get in, that's, that's, a, that's a failure. You don't. You don't have to perseverate on it, but you can acknowledge it. You know, I didn't get in. Maybe I applied a little on the late side. I, I, you know, as I reapply, I've improved my application. Here's the things I've done and I am ready to be a doctor. I had to think about it. I had to think about it twice, you know, and I, I think that's important. People that didn't get in and decide, nope, I'm doing this again. Again, there's that grit, resilience, determination coming through again. I'm going to be a doctor. One of the more frustrating conversations I have with applicants sometimes, especially reapplicants specifically, is the reapplicant who says, my MCAT was low last time. So I I improved my MCAT, but I'm going to submit the same personal statement. No, 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 no. (laughs) Absolutely not. You've yeah, grown, no. right? You better have uh, grown. Sure. Absolutely. Oh, Especially no. these, you know, these early 20s, 20 somethings. They, of course, they're tremendous growth could take taking place at that time. In their oh, lives. yeah. There's all these great things that they can do at that time, right? Absolutely. It's got to go into why I want to go into medicine. You know, I'm Absolutely. ready to go into medicine. What would you have liked me to ask you? Um, I, you know, you <laughs> it's a great interview. I, I there's a lot of information. What what would I've liked to ask? I guess. Maybe a little bit about why, what makes Wash U unique as a medical school? What makes um, Wash U unique as a medical school? <laughs> I think um, it's the people. And I know a lot of people say stuff like that, but this, this place has a culture where it, you'll hear our dean say, it starts from the top, that this place is collaborative. We work together. We have a lot of very smart people hard working people and they love what they do and that turns it 
and it allows them to produce and to work with others and continue to advance medicine forward. And I think that that trickles down faculty love to work with the students. They want to help them. They want to help them grow. Mentorship is so important at this point in a young person's life. You need mentors for your science, mentors for your academics, and mentors for how do I do this thing called life and medicine in the specialty I choose. And I think we at WashU really do appreciate that. And that is how our medical school and our community works. So that's what I'd like to say. And that's a great note to end on. Dr. Ratz, I think we're, we're out of time. Oh. I want to thank you so much for joining me. It's been an absolute delight and pleasure. Appreciate your sharing your expertise. Where can listeners learn more about Washington University School of Medicine? Yes, they can go to mdadmissions.wustl.edu. Sounds good. And we'll include links to the show notes to that URL at accepted.com slash 595 if you didn't catch it. And I'll take you right to the WashU Medical Admissions site, as well as you'll also find links there to other resources that might be helpful to you listeners. Quick reminder, don't miss the Med School Admissions Quiz. Find out if you are really ready to apply and competitive at your target schools. Take the quiz at accepted.com slash medquiz today. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week.